spiritual guru, one of the very few spiritual gurus who are highly respected in our nation today, and not only in our nation, but all over the world. Uh, Shri Kamlesh Patel, that's his original name, Kamlesh D. Patel, Daji. He was born in Gujarat, and uh, he showed an early interest in meditation and in spiritual growth. In 1976, as a pharmacy student in Ahmedabad, he met his guide, who was Sri Ram Chandra of Shah Jahanpur, whom we call Babuji, who was the founder and the first president of Sri Ram Chandra Mission, of which Daji is the head. After graduating with honors in 1980, he moved to the US and practiced pharmacy in New York City, while also continuing the Raj Yoga system of Sahaj Mark with great devotion. He continues to excel in both his material career and in his spiritual life. Daji continued to follow Parth Sathri Raj Gopalachari, who is called Chari Ji, who was the second president of Sri Ramchandra Mission. After Babuji's passing and has held a number of increasingly responsible roles, as well as he has been offering his support to the growth of the mission worldwide. In October 2011, he was named as, as Chari Ji's successor. <clears throat> and in August 2012, uh, Daji was appointed vice president of SRCM with the full powers of the <clears throat> president. <clears throat> SRCM is the Sri Ram Chandra mission due to Chariji's failing physical health. Following Chariji's passing on the 20th of December 2014, he became the spiritual guide of the Sahaj Mark system and the third president of Sri Ram Chandra mission. He is often endearingly referred to as Daji. Daji and his wife have two sons. These days, he's constantly traveling, conducting meditation with yogic transmission for seekers worldwide and speaking at the mission's many centers and ashrams, as well as to the general public through newspaper articles, TV and radio. He's a vital role model for anyone wanting to evolve as a human being and expand consciousness. A spiritual catalyst displaying the perfect blend of the Eastern heart and the Western mind. He is able to connect with people from all walks of life and backgrounds, giving special attention to today's youth. Daji is the fourth spiritual guide in the Sahaj Mark system of Raja Yoga meditation. He is a role model for students of spirituality who seek that perfect blend of Eastern heart and Western mind. He travels extensively and is at home with people from all backgrounds and walks of life, giving special attention to the youth of today. So that's Daji for you. And we have the Daji in conversation uh, with Kabir Bedi. Uh, Kabir Bedi has already joined and uh, he would be conversing with, with Daji. This is a, uh, an experiment that has been evolved uh, by a discussion between uh, the DTRTI and Daji team. And therefore, we hope that you love it. You love this uh, conversation. So let's go ahead with it. And we welcome wholeheartedly uh, Daji as well as Kabir Bedi once again. Yeah, Kabir, we can begin, please. Uh, Pranam, Daji. Pranam. Uh, wonderful to meet you. Can Hello you hear me? You. Very well. Uh, Pranam, Daji. Uh, it's wonderful to see you again and talk to you again. You did me the great honor of actually reading my book and saying wonderful <laughs> things about it, for which I'm immensely grateful. As you know, in that book, there's a whole chapter I've devoted to my philosophical inquiry in life called Beaches and Beliefs and um, from my mother's Buddhist tradition, father's Sikh tradition, my own study of various gurus and uh, religious systems because all religious systems give us wonderful ethical um, ways to live life. Um, but at the same time, uh, they are saying different things. And uh, my question was, what is the truth in all this? And, you know, where we come from, much deeper kind of issues. But in this discussion, I'd really like to focus on, uh, on, on, on your teachings as well. So we all understand you much better. And as be, being a spiritual master and the spiritual guide of the heartfulness system of meditation, um, perhaps I'd like you to I'd like to ask you to share with us what is the real value of meditation in our life? What is the use of meditation in life? 
How does it enrich our life in any way? And, and, and what's so hard about doing it? Well, thank you, Kabirji. It's a pleasure seeing you again and interacting with you with this deeper analysis of our existential life. Religion, spirituality, people, I think they have misunderstood and they unfortunately use these two terms interchangeably, but it's very wrong, see. Religion as it is today, it separates us, divides us. All monotheistic religion, they say we are the best. Right? Christianity, Islam, you name it, Judaism. Each one say we are better than the others. Hinduism is polytheistic. It accepts all. But there is a premature acceptance. Why? Because we are taught from beginning that God is everywhere. God is in everything. God. So we worship trees, we worship mountains, we worship sky. Nothing wrong. But it is premature. Because it's a belief which we borrow, which is not yet actualized through our own experiences. So whenever a youth asks a question to father or mother or grandparents, Papa, what do you say about this? That is God. Then you would naturally answer what you've been hearing. God is everywhere. But do you experience it, my dear father? Then father would start scratching his head and say, not yet, my boy, I'm still learning. And so the curiosity dies down very fast from the heart of such young minds, which are constantly looking for. They need guidance, guidance, not in words, maybe in words, but it must ultimately lead to an experience. If someone says, oh, God is there, can I experience godly presence? Meditation helps us dive deeper into ourselves and not just any type of meditation. You know, there are meditations and meditations. In, there are ways of the focus on their breath. There are people who focus on the light outside, like a deepam or a candle. Or some people focus on the sounds they hear. Some people, they focus on the frequencies, uh, some nose, but ultimately, it is all about experiencing, feeling. Are you going to feel here? No. Are you going to feel things in your stomach? No. You have to feel the presence only in the heart. You can feel only there, nowhere else. So we meditate on the presence of the divine source, which is there in everyone's heart. Second element of this heartfulness practice is, you know, we have just watched prosthetics. Uh, Dr. Mehta or Mr. Mehta was explaining in detail with so much of enthusiasm what this Jaipur food has been doing worldwide. It is an aid. It helps you when you don't have your legs and you don't have your arms, they're all amputated. <clears throat> or you have lost for one reason or the other, or maybe you were born like that. But when you get an aid, life changes. See, from misery to delight, from despair to delight, as he says, that's a transformative life. In this meditation through heartfulness way, there is also an aid, aid of transmission. Pranahuti aided meditation transports you into superconscious state instantly. And I, like I always say, please don't believe my words, experience it. And how long does it take? Not much, maybe two or three sessions. And you'll start feeling that inner resources or sources we already have. And with the help of this pranahuti, meditation becomes so much of a joy. Otherwise, when you do it on your own without the help of this pranahuti, what happens? You are stormed by so many thoughts. And after some time, you get, though you have interest, but you lose interest because you're not able to dive deeper within yourself. You are always on the surface. So you need something like this prosthetics that can propel 
our consciousness to higher and higher level that will entice us to meditate regularly you see otherwise we right. give up very fast <laughs> right daji i i um, in my early childhood i was actually ordained as a buddhist monk and i was in uh, <clears throat> burma um, and i led the monastic life and i was trained by this great teacher masi sadha and the vipassana technique and while it is not the heartfulness technique, I must say that at that young age, going through this process gave me an immense understanding of how the mind works and how the mind can run away with you and how the mind often does run away with us. And we're not aware of the fact that our mind is running away out of control and governing our emotions, our feelings, our um, attitude to people. And in this meditation, basically, what it really does is raise your awareness because in focusing on, on, on those aspects of meditation, it makes you more aware of yourself and therefore your consciousness is raised. And then together with the Buddhist teaching of compassion to all and kindness to all and um, those things, it is, was a great help to me. Uh, and it is one of my great regrets that I didn't keep um, following through on that as regularly as I want. Although I always go back to it in times of uh, in times of uh, trouble, and I certainly look forward to um, experiencing heartfulness as well. I'm going to come to Hyderabad and see you early next month, and uh, I look That's forward to um, understanding and sharing your method as well. But tell me. Does one have to give up um, things in life to, to, to meditate? Does one have to stop relating to um, being a family member in that way? I mean, um, does one have to become, in other words, what I'm saying is, does one have to become a recluse to become a meditator? Or can one very much be part of human life in its everydayness and meditate? Well, this is very oft repeated question to us that will I have to leave my family. In fact, I was also once upon a time when I was 18 years old, I was head bent on leaving my family and join a group of monks that were roaming on the Narbada bank. They were all Agori Babas, you see. One of the eldest monk advised me, Pete, I say, Ishwar nahi milta hai. मेरा 80 साल उम्र हो गया अभी तक मैं ढूंढता हूं बचपन से निकल गया था ईश्वर की खोज में अभी भी नहीं मिलता है तू मेरे जैसे भूल मत कर मैं घर वापस नहीं जा सकता है शर्मिंदा हो जाता हूं एंड लेटर विद इन विद इन फ्यू मंथ्स आई फाउंड माय गुरु एंड हिज फिलॉसफी इज वेरी फंडामेंटल दैट गॉड इज एवरीवेयर एंड ही कैन बेस्ट बी फाउंड एंड एक्सपीरियंस विद इन योर होम्स सेकंडली Marriage has a purpose. You cannot abandon your family. See, and yeah. if you know God has a reason why He created two sexes. If one was enough, He'd say, "Okay, go ahead, <laughs> the way you are." But two are necessary. Family life is where we sacrifice for each other, and through that we love each other to its maximum. And this love can be replicate it very easily and we can relate it to God. Mm -hmm. So we just have to make a transference and mm -hmm. then from there you are able to love all. So right. very simple statements and simple steps. Right, right. You know, I, I raise this question because uh, Guru Nanak, uh, who was the ancestor of our family, also had big debates with pundits, with, with mullahs, with various people about whether one has to leave the home or not. And Guru Nanak's central teaching was that you must be part of life and through life find God, uh, through life find your evolution, through life raise yourself. And that seems to be very much your message as well, that you can combine the two and each will enrich the other. <clears throat> There's uh, Before I, I, I came on this session, um, somebody asked me the question, I said, what is the meaning of life? And I said, these are questions better suited to my session with, with Daji, as far as I'm concerned. 
the meaning of life is life itself is evolution, um, becoming the best you can be, uh, finding your purpose. Because ultimately, I said, the meaning of life is the meaning you give your life. But how do you see that, Daji, in terms of people seeking the meaning of life and saying, who am I? What am I? Um, what am I here for? Uh, what is my purpose in life? How do you feel about that? It's too late a question to ask. You're already, <laughs> you're already sailing in life. God created you. Now we have to find the purpose. What is the purpose of my existence? What is the purpose of this life? Meaning of life we can find by solving this purpose. Does my purpose differ from your purpose of existence? I don't think so. Good. Your level of perfection, my level of perfection, is it in my field or is it only in your field where there isn't? You know, you are one of the finest actors, right? You are from Guru Nanak Sahab's. I would say you are inheriting the direct genome from his blood. You are a bloodline, maybe 18th or 19th in the line in the hierarchy in the lineage. Now you are been you have been gifted with that potential. Nature has granted you that. <clears throat> you have excelled in one field. I'm a son of a farmer who ultimately became a pharmacist and started a business. Now we can explore all these things in various fields. Nothing wrong with it. It's great. But perfection is not there. Though we try to achieve the best we can in our own profession. But there is something greater than that. Because however great oh, an actor you can be, or however great a pharmacist I can be, or however uh, you know philanthropist one can be like Mr. Ratan Tata. Yet, there is perfection needed at an inner level. Is my inner self ready in accepting my perfection outside? No. I'm still hungry from inside. Hungry for what? That inner fulfillment. You see, if we decide to divide our system, this then system in the sense, the entire being of me, I have this outer being, physical body. Then as I go within, then I have mind, I have intellect, I have ego, I have consciousness. What is it that supports this four? It is my soul. This is very well understood. Right? Now, in order to nourish this body, I take balance diet, I do exercise, I can keep it fit. In order to nourish this, my head and heart, I educate myself, I interact with people. Right? What about nourishing the soul? That's where the problem lies. We know how to nourish the body, we know how to nourish the heart and mind, but we do not have the resources how to enrich the soul. And that's why this pranahuti, yogic transmission, which is being graced upon us, masters of character, and and we enrich our own spirit, our own soul, <clears throat> in its own trail, you know, just as the healthy mind and healthy mind, they coexist. But we do not right. equate it and we don't complement the soul part of it. You see, if you did, then the whole system will become wholesome, complete. Right, right. So, so. Daji, um, this is the second time you've used the word pranahuti. Uh, I, I, I'd like to understand a little more by what you mean by pranahuti. Uh, I, I know um, this is a question many people would like to know, because it seems to be um, the wellspring from which the strength and the um, uh, the strength and the energy of your meditation system comes from. Um, so tell us a little more about Pranahuti and this transmission that you talked about. Okay. In order to understand it, you see, it's like you're asking, asking a question. When you have not tasted mango, please tell me about mango. Mm -hmm. If you never had it in your life, I can go on describing it. <laughs> yes. And you will not make a head or tail out of all this. 
Right, right. Okay. So now, pranahuti, theoretically speaking, is the divine energy that a yogi is able to tap into the source and transmit it to the recipients who are desiring to have it. And once you close your eyes, you start experiencing that. And at the end of that meditation, you will see, wow, there's a big difference between, you know, when I started meditation, the state of my mind was something, and now after the meditation, it is different. So we can see the impact of it. Right. It's like it's like sunlight. Do we see sunlight? We don't see sunlight. But when it falls on objects, we see the presence. So, so like that, our consciousness get highlighted in the presence of this pranahuti. Actually, it's a nourishment in another way. It's also a transformative energy. It gives supports to our consciousness. So. What you're basically saying, if I understand correctly, is that when going through our lives, where we face, you know, envy, jealousy, competition, all kinds of kind of things coming at us, and, and we feel them too, um, you're saying that if one meditates in that way and receives the transmission of pranahuti, it will change us in ways that will benefit us and society. That's if I'm right, the essence of what you're saying. The hundred percent. Right. And um, does one need to find, does one need to have a guru to do this? Um, or can one just do it on one, one's own? Well, since you are depending on the successful meditation on Pranahuti, you need a capable guru who can transmit to you, see? Right. See, um, I, I, I share with you a very small story. For example, there is a new temple coming up in your area. What generally happens is they install a statue, a murti. And a pandit will charge the statue with prana. And they call it prana pratishtha. You know, this is the tradition in our country. And because of this prana pratishtha, you are able to, they say, that they are able to feel the energy oozing from this divine murti. Now, one basic question one would ask, a small boy can ask such a question, that look, if you are able to transmit or establish pratistha, prana, in the murti, murti is not going to say, I experience it. Mm. Murti is quiet. But if a pandit can do this prana pratistha in Kabir Bedi, then Kabir Bedi will say, I feel it or I don't feel it. Right. You get the picture. So or you always need somebody else to make sure that you have it or not. Then you can say, no, this fellow is a bluff and this fellow is a right person. See? Okay. Right. Um, Daji, among my many philosophical questions that I was exploring uh, as to whether <clears throat> The souls, whether there's rebirth, etc. One of the questions that um, was always comes up repeatedly is: Is there such a thing as destiny, or are things not predestined? Is is are things predestined or are they not? Yeah. Well, the world was created. And every person, every individual was given a free will. It's up to you how to make use of this free will. Right. Based on this free will, we act, we behave. And it is this that views our destiny. There is nothing fixed. Either we say you, <clears throat> you inherit from nature or you nurture it. I am a strong believer of designing your own destiny. There is no God who manipulates your destiny. Hundred percent. Like in the case of Lord Rama, she could manipulate the destiny of Lord Rama and Lord Sita. You see, there is always a third party who can fool around with you, but that's not part of destiny. That is manipulation by somebody else. But you can, as an individual, either you want to follow through this or not. 
If I was the father of Lord Rama, I would say to hell with you, Kaikai. You, I'd like to fulfill my promises, but not like this. This is a wrong thing. Similarly, this pride of fulfilling a promise, our country changed because of that. It's nonsense. Mm -hmm. Mahabharata also suffers because of Bhishma's promise. He says, oh, I have to protect Hastinapur and I cannot side with Lord Krishna or with Pandava, though I know they are right. But then you promise, you have promised right, right, the wrong right. person. You see, yep. so your ego should not come in fulfillment. So ego changes the destiny. Your desires, your greed changes the destiny. See? Right. If you're following your heart, you're on your way. <laughs> I, I, I raise this question, Daji, because I, I did read your book, Designing Destiny. Oh, and lovely. I learned, <laughs> I learned much from it. And it's full of very deep uh, insights. And um, so, essentially, you're saying is, you make your own destiny through your free will, through your choices, through the thing. And there's nothing as though something is absolutely set in stone in the future uh, that you can't alter given your vision, your drive, and your desire to evolve in certain ways or reach certain things and make a commitment to that. You make your own destiny, in other words. And one more question, Daji. You know, many people uh, believe in different things. Uh, they can be a Christian, they can be a Muslim, they can be a Hindu, they can be Hindus who believe in Ganesh, people who believe in Shiv, believe in Shiv Bhats, people who believe in uh, other Gurus. Is there any contradiction between these people believing what they believe and doing your system of meditation? Is there, is there any disloyalty involved there? Is there any um, conflict in, involved in the two ways of looking at life and philosophy? Well, I had this problem also because I was raised in a very orthodox Hindu family. I used to do education in Ali based. We used to do the Havano. Three days we'll end up doing as children, see? Mm -hmm. And when I came, when I came across and experienced meditation. Then I realized, yeah, look, this is something that is transformative. People keep on doing these rituals after rituals after rituals and don't go anywhere. We keep on doing all this, breaking the coconuts and lighting up the deep pump. They are all symbolic things. For chance, if you forget that, oh, I didn't do this, you feel so bad about it, and you say some calamities might occur. I don't think God is such a brute that can and he'll punish you because you just forgot how to do your dipam. Not at no. all. But when you have real diamonds in your hand, would you carry on with stones? Right. So if that can answer you, well, your experience will teach you how far I need to go with my rituals. No, am right. I not interested in experiencing? So in a way, a person graduates from a school of religion to the school of spirituality. And does he stay there forever? No. There too, there is graduation. You move away from spirituality and transcend into the realm of realities where there are no rituals, there are no thinking, there is no feeling, but you become. You right. become very simple, <clears throat> very pure, without any broadcast. And that too, perhaps, becomes very heavy on you. you right. know? And that too, then, you, you try to detach yourself from this ultimate bliss that you get. And see, what do I have to do with this bliss? What will I do? And you discard that also. And that is real detachment. You know, people say, let me become sannyasi. That is not detachment. Ultimate test is this. God grants you the ultimate bliss and see if you fall for it. Right. If you but fall it, for the ultimate bliss, you have failed. It transcended. You better transcend that too. Wow. Daddy, you know, I feel that um, 
ritual have their place in society. Religions give us this wonderful series of rituals, celebrations for the birth of a child, for your marriage, for your death. I mean, when an atheist dies, you almost have to write a whole new screenplay of how this person should be buried, because there is no a system uh, for the rites of passage. Um, if somebody gets married and they don't believe in any religion, they have to think of, are they just going to go to the registrars and get married? There, are, there is a great beauty in the rituals of religion that mark the rites of yeah. passage. Great beauty in the rituals that people follow, even in worshipping mm, the gods and the idols that they do. Because those idols represent certain values to them, certain concepts to them. You worship Lakshmi for one reason, you worship Durga for another reason, you worship Saraswati for another reason. <clears throat> They're all symbolic of the energies in the universe and what people relate to. And therefore, ritual and within religion certainly have their place. <clears throat> but you're right, it shouldn't become something that blinds you to the need to move beyond and find a deeper meaning through looking within yourself, through practices like heartfulness meditation that give them a deeper understanding of the, f the real force within the, the most powerful forces in the universe that can elevate your consciousness, that can make you a more evolved human being. Um, so those, those are things which I'm certainly getting from what uh, you're saying. And I understand um, the message you're saying that it's important to rise above ritual as well and not just be stuck in them. Um, because the real proof of the pudding is in the eating, which is um, the energy that flows from the divine. Am I right now? You would you like? To well, <laughs> it is not as straight as that. You see, we don't abandon any ritual. Suppose your children has to be married. There will be ritual. There will be celebration, right? There will be certain rituals like moving around the fire. Why such a ritual? You know, walking around the fire, or why garland each other? This has nothing to do with God. It is not going to make you realize the ultimate. These are rituals that will provoke some thoughts in you. Why am I walking around the fire seven times? In life, you will face such fires and you better stay together, follow each other in harmony. So rituals have meanings, but performed without any understanding. It's a fool's walk in windless. Mm -hmm. Similarly, when you garland each other, what does that mean? It means simply, I adore you, I love you, right? But what about when you don't have that? People do namaskaram every single day too. And they have, God knows how many gods they have on the wall. Every calendar will have different gods or goddesses. And mm -hmm. with one stroke, they will do namaskaram, 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 and walk out of the house going to business. And there again, after they open the shop, they will do homam, I mean, not homam, but they will do lip deepam and agarbatti and all that. Whom are you trying to fool, actually? Mm -hmm. Are you doing this out of love for God? Or because if you don't do it, you may not have a good business? You have to first find out why you are doing it, you see. Right. And all these forms, our Shastras also talks about the same thing, Gita which is a funda, fundamental thing of our Hinduism. Lord Krishna speaks so often in there, so many slokas are there, where he says, forms are okay, you better move from form to formlessness. What does that mean? It means you can worship a representative called our Murti. Durga or Saraswati or Lakshmi. It's a form right. that you have created yeah. for your understanding. But once you have started worshipping, try to understand why, what is the essence behind this, and transcend these forms and go beyond all these things. There are four types of prayers. Artha, Dharma, Kama, Moksha. To fulfill these four, we have created Lakshmi, Lakshmi, right? Artha, Dharma, to fulfill your duties, Kama, your passion, 
It's a basic requirement to fulfill your karma or passion and moksha. Now, when we analyze all this further, Kabirji, that if you have a completely fulfilled life of artha, you have a rolling income and karma is missing. What will become of your life? What's the use of this money? Right? You may have prolific karma life, but missing out on dharma. Right. It's a flip-flop life, you see. All three can be missing, but if dharma is fulfilled or moksha is fulfilled, then too, there is a topsy-turvy world. But moksha having fulfilled, once you attain that liberation, then whether dharma, karma, and artha comes or not, you are way ahead of the game, see. That's why minimum, minimum that we should anticipate from our life is attain moksha. There is much more though. There is much more after moksha. There is much more after liberation. And again, it's a matter of experience. So the prayers, we should be able to understand why am I praying? Why am I begging? Is God a deaf individual that he doesn't understand my needs? Mm. Is he? So, okay. So um, let's not get into what lies beyond moksha because at this stage of our lives and existence, we would be very happy just to reach moksha because what's beyond that is a philosophical inquiry, which I think would take far more time uh, to understand. But, you know, they say karma plays a very important role uh, in our lives, in, in what we do, uh, what, what what happens to us as a result of what we do. My question, Daji, is who is uh, keeping track of what I do and what I don't do? Who is going to reward me or punish me for what I do and don't do? Uh, what is the role of karma in our existence? Yourself. Right? We have, <clears throat> as we discussed earlier, soul. We all have soul. Otherwise, we couldn't have been talking. Right? It is the life force. We carry this life force, life after life, during our transmigration from life after life. Now, what else gets transferred besides the soul? See, just as <clears throat> sun, the moon, the earth, Jupiter, all everything has its own field, gravitational field. Mm -hmm. Likewise, each soul has its own field. Right. This field, based on the karma, keeps on enhancing or keeps on contracting, either expansion or contraction. You know the definition of the word Brahma and definition of the word Atman? It's very interesting to understand how these names were derived in Sanskrit. Brahma, it comes from two words, two letters, a Bruha and Man. Bruha means to expand. Man is to contemplate or think. Atman, At means to move and think. Atman, Man means to think. So you see the dimensional changes from, if you see it this way, movement and thinking, and here at the Brahma, it is expansion and contemplation. Thinking and contemplation are different. Very different. Moving and expansion are also different. Moving is this way. Expansion is 3D, three-dimensional. Now, when we talk about this consciousness aspect of it, the field that we talked about, as it expands because of your actions, because right. of your thoughts, because of your attitude, it can cover the whole universe. But why does it contract and fall into its own black hole? Your desires, your greed, it, it destroys or distorts the field around the soul. So this field gets affected by this what we call our actions and thoughts and attitudes especially. Mm -hmm. And we carry this field along with the soul and that is determining our future. It is the and field. That, that, so that, that is what causes the 
reaction to what I do. That is what gives me the result of what I do. Good, bad, evil, pure, whatever I do, creates its own reaction. It's in us. <laughs> So, you're, it's in a sense almost like Newton's law. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. You know, no, 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 no. I don't agree with Newton's law. No. In fact, it's a contrary that every action has the same reaction. Not no, 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 no. In spirituality, it doesn't work. In the emotional world also, it doesn't work. I mean, you recall, you have written so well about your, you know, your love. Uh, your first love. When she winked at you first, did you wink back equally? No. You had perhaps a heart, I mean, earthquake in your heart when she winked at you for the first time. Mm -hmm. It was just a mere wink of an eye. But see the reaction in the heart. Right, right. It's, it's tremendous. So the, the law that applies, like Newton's law, Actions and reactions are equal, not in the spiritual world and not in the emotional world. They have different impact. You may right. just say to someone, you are so stupid. Mm -hmm. And see the reaction it creates. Far that person, disproportionate, what you say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Far more disproportionate. Quite right, mm -hmm. quite right. Uh, there's much to learn there. Um, but what you're saying essentially is that the person, the, 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 what is creating the reaction to your actions, which is karma, or the effect of your actions, stems from your soul in terms of what you have put into it as a result of that action. And that affects you in ways that create your karma. Am I right in assuming that? Or am I, have I missed something here? Well... <clears throat> Soul provides the field for action and remains a witness, doesn't mm -hmm. participate. Right. Um, Daji, um, unfortunately, we're running out of time, but since you're here and since there's so many distinguished people listening, um, could I ask you to give us a demonstration of your heartfulness technique, of which you are the spiritual master? Can we? Can you guide us into some kind of meditation before you, uh, before this discussion ends? How much time we have now for meditation? Uh, I'm sure they could extend it in five, ten minutes. Oh, well, in five, ten minutes you can't do meditation. <laughs> I need at least fifteen minutes, it's okay. If the organizers <laughs> agree, we can proceed with fifteen minute session. Ideally speaking, I need half hour. But we can have... Right glimpse or a zealot of it and later on those who are serious meditators you can log into our master classes by heartfulness on so many methods of meditation so many methods of improving consciousness so many methods of you know getting rid of your anger mm -hmm. people are suffering from excessive sexual desires there are also techniques and methods how to regulate it. It's not that you want to destroy it. You want to regulate it, see. So things of that nature. Um, we started about okay. 15 minutes late. Do we have permission to continue? Yeah, surely, before? absolutely. Let's go ahead with these 15 minutes. I'm mm -hmm. sure that we are all going to be benefited by it. Right. Daji, we have permission for at least 15 minutes. Thank so you. Thank you, Arvind. Give us a, a jalak. <laughs> As you put it, <laughs> all your <laughs> wonderful okay, sir. and techniques. Okay. So it's a very simple way. Um, I would first walk you through this process of relaxing. It will take about three, four minutes. And then immediately we begin our meditation. And I'll walk you through each step. Okay. So let's gently close our eyes. <clears throat> Imagine for a moment that the energy from Mother Earth is entering through your feet and helping you relax as it enters. Feel the relaxation happening in your feet and your ankle.
allow this energy to move upward, your lower legs and calf muscles. this energy to move upward to your knees as you feel relaxation there. Now your thigh, thigh muscles. Your hip area. Allow this energy to move up, helping you relax your back. Now your abdominal area and chest area. Now your sh shoulders, feel the shoulders almost melting away and becoming lighter. Permit this energy to descend into your arms, starting with your biceps, your elbow, lower arms including wrist, your palms and your fingers. Let this energy ooze out through your fingertips, it's okay. Now pay attention to your neck muscles. Allow this energy to move upward, relaxing your jaws. Drop your jaw if you have to, suspending your tongue inside your mouth. Relaxing your lips, all your facial muscles, including forehead, your eyebrows, your eyelids, the nose. Your earlobes and top of your head. Now scan the whole system from top to toe. Okay. By chance, any part of your body which is still stressed, you can revisit and help it relax. Now, <clears throat> Pay attention to your heart. Imagine that 
My heart is already filled with divine light. which is attracting my attention inward. I'm meditating on the presence of the divine light in the heart. I'll be transmitting to you this pranahuti from here. Kindly prayerfully accept it. for another 10 minutes or so.
बस कीजिए दैट्स ऑल फॉर नाउ थैंक यू दाजी थैंक यू सो मच यू हैव शेयर समथिंग वेरी वैल्यूबल विद अस आई एम श्योर ईच ऑफ अस फेल्ट द इफेक्ट ऑफ दैट um thank you so much for your for your guidance for your insights for your presence and uh, i'm sure a lot of people will have a lot of questions um for you as well um but i think we've come to the end of our time but i hope that uh, people get a chance to ask you this question on your website or by writing to you or by coming to your presence and meeting you i thank you once again for your wonderful presence and for sharing everything you have with this wonderful audience thank you daji thank you kabir ji thank you and thank you everyone especially the director general at nadt shri nitin gupta ji additional director general of dtrgi shri vivek kumar and of course Arvind Mishra ji course director I do highly appreciate if anyone has any question please do write directly to kamlesh at srcm or heartfulness.org or daji at heartfulness.org I will try my best thank you thank you so much daji on behalf of everybody thank you thank you sir thank you thank you daji for having given us uh, your valuable time most valuable time and your guidance i am sure that we we'll take our people a long distance into uh, understanding the body the mind the soul and we also thank kabir bedi ji for having been with us for being patient and taken uh, a one a one hour of uh, a break in between but you have been there for the last three hours i would say with us and a very valuable time for all our senior officers who have been listening to you we thank you on behalf of the national academy of direct taxes which is the apex body for training of the department income tax department officers we thank you on behalf of the direct tax regional training institute uh, who are a part of the national academy of direct taxes mounting this particular program uh, we are extremely thankful to your team daji who has been in touch with us and uh, Uh, they have offered us a great deal of uh, support in organizing this program and we've been in touch with them and we'll be sharing a video of the program with them also so that it can be curated and given to our participants daji and kabir great deal of thanks to you and big namaskar and prostration before you daji thank you <coughs> thank you daji i look forward to coming to pay my respects to you in hyderabad when i come next month You're most welcome, and be prepared to sign a lot of books. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, <laughs> you okay. Thank you. Thank you. For you, anything, Daji. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.